Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is today is 21st of November, and this is an interview with engineer Paul Burgess or Burge. I don't know how is the correct pronunciation, Paul. Burgess, 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 Burgess. Burgess. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, this is a follow-up presentation after our ICS4 uh, uh, summit, which stands for International Crisis Summit. So. We will uh, uh, directly deep dive into the slides because I, I we want to be very uh, expeditive and uh, and give you the chance to talk as long as you need and I mean it and right. uh, give us the 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 entire talk because twenty minutes is not uh, is not uh, making justice for your presentation. No justice. <laughs> no justice for your presentation. So please. Okay, well, my talk's about climate alarmism and population control because the climate issue is not really a climate issue. It's a political issue to control peoples. So by population control, I mean controlling populations, not birth control. <laughs> so that's right. what my talk is about. The next slide. One moment, please. Okay, there is a little bit of a problem. Let's see. Oh, my mouse is on the other screen. Okay, cool. Next slide. Yes, please. This, this one? Next one. Uh, not this one. This one? Yes. Okay. Well, climate doesn't matter. That'll do. That'll do. Right, climate models are not evidence. And all those squiggly lines on this graph, those gray squiggly lines, are actually 102 different climate models. And they're all consistent in one sense. They're all wrong because the green line is the actual measurement of the temperatures. So they don't agree with the real world. This is really important in science. Unless mm -hmm. your idea agrees with the real world, it's no good. So what you it's a bit like putting 102 doctors in a room, all of whom's treatments have been proven wrong. And the doctors say, well, let's have a consensus and come up with a red line, which is a sort of consensus average and come out the room and say, we're ready to treat you now. That's not a good idea. So that is that that is what I'm trying to explain with this slide. All the models are running far too hot. They're three times faster warming than real life. There's a good reason for this. And the reason is, and I'll try to explain it during this, I'll be able to expand a bit more than I could in the talk. But mm -hmm. basically, we are now at peak. We're almost at peak. We just entered a cooling period in climate. And between now and the next 12 years, 2035, we will be cooling. And so it's going to get harder and harder for the alarmists to show their lies. But if you look at the root of that graph, you'll see the red line their, their model average almost agrees. Well, that's because they did it backwards. So as soon as it goes by itself to go forwards, the red line and all the models go off in the sky and leave reality alone. So do, climate models are opinions. There's lots of different opinions. And in fact, if you've got so many different opinions, as all those lines show, you obviously can't be right because you can't have everyone right. And they're not right unless they agree with the observed. So that's the point I'm trying to make with that particular graph. Next slide, please. Sure. This one. Yes. Now, this is really important. And it's a professor, uh, Richard Feynman. And he said this. It doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. That means if it doesn't agree with what you observe in the real world, it's wrong. And what you must understand is that science is just trying to understand how the world works. That's what science is. So people get carried away in academia and their own little theories and they forget where they are. And they're all career building with as many papers they can publish as possible. And it, since the late 90s, universities have not become places of learning. They become places of propaganda. And I've just shown you how the models disagree, disagree with real life. And that means they're wrong. End of subject. And that they are wrong. So always remember this. It's fundamental to all science. If you do not follow that, then you do not follow science and you're not a scientist. Next slide, please. 
Right, this is um, satellite temperatures. And as you can see here, um, we sort of rise, they all, they all start in 1979. There's a reason for this, actually. The actual satellites did go prior to that a bit. And we have lots of records prior to that. But 1979, in the last century, was the peak of the cold period. And in the 1970s, we had the um, Ice Age coming scare. So they start their, their measurements of temperature at the lowest there has been, right, for a long time. But uh -huh. um, so uh, if you come forward there, they're pretty level, actually. They're not too bad. And then there's a peak and they go up in steps, as you can see. After the year 98, they sort of leveled out and then they started to grow again to today's values. We have plateaued today. In fact, Noah's data today, and one of my subscribers has given me a link. I didn't realize it was there. And anyone can go onto this and find out what Noah's version of the temperatures are. And what they show is it's cooling now. They actually show it cooling now, but they, the propaganda does not say that. But their figures are wrong in any event, because what's happened, let's take Euro, um, uh, uh, Willie Soon and the Connolly scientists from Ireland started to investigate temp land temperatures. And they found that 75% of the stations used that they looked at in many countries, 75% um, the urban urban areas have grown and incorporated them in other words we're, we're warming ourselves we're measuring some i mean last year as i'll show you in a minute um, we had a heat wave they said in britain but they used temperatures which were bogus temperatures so now we've got natural if, if you have a if you have a climate station uh, and it's in a field but over time it becomes in housing becomes with cars around it becomes in a car park and all those things have happened then it's not the same temperature gauge. Yeah. And so you get a natural rise due to human urbanization. 75% of the gauges are wrong. So, but these measurements here are satellite and, and that therefore they're not subject to that. So they're, uh, they're more acceptable, if you like. There are possible errors, but they're more acceptable. But the other thing from this graph is it shows many cycles, ups and downs, ups and downs. And the truth is our climate is many, many different cycles. Next slide, please. So the, the, the website is uh, drroyspencer.com, right? The website for that one? Yes, Roy Spencer. Roy Spencer is the man who developed the satellite measurements for NASA. So mm -hmm. he is responsible for the satellite measurements for NASA. And um, he he is, if you like, on my side in all this. And he's actually had a number of bullet shots, you know, through, through his glass window in his house. So they've actually shot at him after his work. But um, so Roy Spencer is a good man telling the truth and mm -hmm. and he developed the satellite measurement system for nasa these are not idiots i use i only use proper sources for all my information and i always quote the source okay thanks for clarification right this is a list of some of the if you like the i'll call it solar system cycles there's a lot of them so you've got right. your sun cycle everyone knows about 11 years it reverses polarity the sun every 22 years and it goes on it comes down to the Milankovitch cycles there, 100,000 years and things like this. So there are many variations. And one of the important ones, actually, is the 210 to 240 year cycle there, which is actually governed by Uranus. Now, let me explain this. Okay. People think of us. People think the sun's in the middle and we all go around it. Actually, mm -hmm. the sun and the big planets really affect the position of the sun. So the sun actually moves all over the place mm -hmm. in many different paths because it's being pulled by the planets. It does not stay in the center. And you're not going to believe me, whilst the, whilst the astronomers knew this, the climate people didn't. So they didn't allow for that. But there's a 200 and odd year, around about 200 year, we'll call it cycle. And that's a very important one because over just... We're coming to an end of that cycle now. That cycle now has peaked, and we're going to go down. Now, these cycles can add and take away from each other. So if you get two combining, you get a big thing. And if you get one taken away from the other, it reduces its effect. So the cycles are very, very important. But the longer-term cycles, we don't notice as humans, because, because if it's a 40,000-year cycle and our lifespan, let's make it easy as 100 years, that's pretty good. We, we would hardly notice it. So what matters are the two, three, four hundred, one hundred, and the other shorter cycles. Next slide, please. 
Right, in addition to those like the astronomical cycles, there are ocean cycles, and these are very important. And we've got the El Nino and the La Nina. The La Nina is the cold cycle in the Pacific. The El Nino is the warm cycle. Mm -hmm. Now, we're just at the moment, we're experiencing a big El Nino. That's happening at the moment. And that's warm the planet. In fact, the sea temperature at the moment, sea temperatures are very high. But that is coming to an end next year. Around about the spring of next year, we should see that go and we'll enter the La Nina and the cooling. One particular work I looked at made the point that the <clears throat> warming ones, the El Ninos and the La Ninas, group together. So in actual fact, one particular paper I looked at explained all the temperature changes since 1959 until today just by that, just by the groups of El Ninos. It isn't the climate scientists assume, well, one warms, one cools, we can ignore them. No, you can't because you get temperature changes going across decades because of them. So the ocean cycles are very important. Now, in addition to the La Nina and the El Nino, there's things like the 40, well, 25 to 40 year Pacific cycle. Now, this, this actually is a bigger cycle underneath the El Ninos, if you like, and also the Atlantic cycle, which is up to 85 years. So these cycles come in and combine. Now, when the, the Atlantic cycle, the cooling part of that is coming in 2035, will have entered the cooling. But before that, before that, we'll have been cooling anyway because of the Pacific cycle. So the oceans contain most of the heat on Earth. 71% of Earth is oceans. Right. Seas and, oceans. And, and, and they contain they contain 50 times the CO2 of the atmosphere, and they contain many times the heat, the, much more heat in, in the in water than it is on land, which is why you get sea mists and things, because the land will warm up and cool quite quickly, but the sea doesn't, right? Uh, and so and so the sea is vital. It's what drives our planet climate more than any other aspect. Okay, so um, you'll get these cycles as well. Now, one of the, now when you get the planet warming or cooling, it always warms and cools from the glow, from the poles, right? From mm -hmm. the poles. Mm -hmm. So um, and then it comes in. So at the moment we are experiencing. We've just had the coldest year on record in the Antarctic. Uh, 2021 was its coldest year on record but it's been cooling for 40 years and that's not me saying that it's nasa and we've also had very cold springs um in the arctic and uh, extra buildup on the arctic sort of compensating for later but this all these signs are coming together we've got very cool um summer afternoons in america and things like this so there are many indicators now of the beginning of the turn as we turn into this cold period. So I'm putting my neck on the block here. We are going to be cooling. But you watch it. The, the climate alarmists will say all the cooling is caused by global warming. You watch. They, they will make any excuse at any time. So I'm putting it on record now. Expect cooling. Yeah. And they also <laughs> said there will come a time soon when children would not see snow. They were wrong. They said the Arctic would be gone by... 2010, 2014, 2017, the ice, gone. No, it isn't. It's now building back up, by the way. And I can show all the graphs for this. You know, I haven't got them on this particular presentation because it was limited to 20 minutes. But <laughs> the, the so the Arctic is not, as they're saying, it's not going away. It's going to build up now. Uh, the Arctic is contained by land, so it's it can only get to a certain size, whereas the Antarctic floating ice doesn't. Uh, that can really expand. There's no land around it. There's land in the middle. The Antarctic itself is a continent, but the actual sea ice. So uh, it'll cool from the globes. But as it cools, it starts to affect our temperatures in Europe and so on and in America. And you, you'll be feeling this. So I'm expecting because of that, um, the hurricanes, I think, will start to increase. They've been very low recently. You see, the warmer it is in the poles in the north and south, the less difference between the equator and the, and the poles. The less difference, there's no, no need, there's need for less hurricanes to bring the heat up. The job of the hurricanes is natural. It brings the heat from the equatorial regions upwards. If it gets colder, which it's going to, you will actually get more hurricanes. And that's why we've had less in the past. Okay, so these are very important features, but they all combine together in a complex set of pulses. Now, you can analyze all of this 
Now I'm going to pose a question to people watching. If I hit you in the back of the head with a bat every five minutes, and I continue to do this week in, week out, and you're sitting in a chair, bang, bang, every five minutes. And then after a sudden bang, if someone said to you, what's the probability of the next bang coming? You'd answer them in five minutes. You'd get used to that. That's what, how I analyze and other people have analyzed the climate. We don't even have to go in the causes. We look for the cycles and then we try to find out what causes that cycle. So it's a very different thing to this amazingly silly models they do. So they've got no evidence. I have evidence backed up by experience. Okay. So uh -huh. that, that's where I am. So there we are on that. Right. Right, this is a good one. I didn't cover it at all in, in my talk. One of the aspects that no one can model, and I, I mean the climate alarmists, they put a fudge factor in like a, a single number to guess. No one models it, are clouds. Now, clouds reflect the sun back, reflect radiation back and cool the earth. And what's mm -hmm. been discovered is when the sun is weak, when the sun radiation is weak in the 11 and other cycles it has, because there are more than the 11 year cycles in the sun, those little cycles are on top of big sun cycles. Yeah. Uh -huh. So when it goes weak, like they call solar minima and things like this, when it, when the sun goes weak, the cosmic rays, now cosmic rays come from exploding stars from supernova and the cosmic rays are all over the uh, all over our galaxy. They're stronger in the arms of the galaxy. So there's patches of very, big cosmic rays but when the sun gets weak it allows the cosmic rays into earth and they form the nucleus for clouds for water vapor yeah so they form clouds so believe it or not exploding stars from the past help form clouds and they can cause major cooling of the earth if the earth gets covered in clouds you're in for a very cool time to put it simply so that's what i wanted to do there okay so Something what you say that the, the clouds, the Pardon? clouds part, the clouds are influenced by something that happened way, way, way back in the past. Correct, millions, maybe millions, millions of years. Uh -huh. Yes, that's correct. An actual yeah. fact that there's a lot of work being done on it, and a lot of work. And the man, and the, um, the, as an Israeli and I think Danish professor, have done the most serious work on it. And uh, the Israeli professor says, "I will bet my house I am right, but my wife won't let me." Yes, but uh, it really is. When you look at the evidence, it's extremely strong, extremely strong that the, that, that, that the cosmic rays are helping to form the nuclei to form clouds and cover the Earth. And, and, and it's highly correlated with the past. And he goes way back with the past. But by the way, you cannot get any research money for any of this. So the people doing all this work against the agenda will not get any help from any university, right? Any Anyone. So... Uh, but but so what I'm introducing now are some of the factors that affect our climate, right? And um, so that's where I am. Next slide, please. Right. The whole heart of the deception, of the climate deception, and it is a deception, is CO2. That's mm -hmm. the heart of it. So mm -hmm. now I'm going to explain, and this may surprise people what I'm going to say. Now I'm going to explain the CO2 myth. Next slide, please. This is the CO2 molecule coming up. There it is. If you play the video, can you? There's a video okay. there. Yeah, it actually, you'll see the mobbling and stretching and everything. The molecule stretches and wobbles in four different ways, four modes. That's what stores the heat. It's this excitement of the molecule. And CO2 is a great, great greenhouse molecule. It really is. And it, and, and, and it stores the heat and holds it in. Um, to heat the atmosphere. Yes, it does. It's not just good, it's very good at doing it. Now that I surprise people with because they assume I'm going to say CO2 and all this. No, no, it's the opposite. CO2 is superb at warming the planet. Yes. <laughs> so let's get that. Now, the, what I'm going to, that's a reference really for what I'm going to say. It's the work by, I, cannot, I can't pronounce the first man's name, Win, Winger Garden, I think and Happer, William Happer. Um, these are the two scientists that came up with what I'm going to show you. Next slide, please. Right, this looks complicated, but children can understand it once I explain it. The outer blue curve there, imagine an Earth without any greenhouse gases. 
Mm -hmm. How how, how, how the the shortwave radiation coming in from the sun heats the earth. But when it passes it back, back, it's infrared. Infrared is what you feel from an electric fire or a wood fire. That's what you feel. That's infrared. And the infrared spectrum there across the bottom, that's 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 the different frequencies or the different wavelengths. Same thing of infrared. Yeah. And up the side is is how much is going out into space. So if you look just above the 600 there, about 600, you've got a peak at the top of it. It says N2. That is the peak going out. So if you had this perfect body without any any well without any greenhouse gases to be exact that's how much you'd have but we don't have that we have greenhouse gases of which co2 is a really big one and if you look there underneath that green wiggly line in the middle is a valley and in that valley is the co2 that's being captured and held by the atmosphere now the problem is that that co2 is so good <coughs> at capturing the heat it catches all the heat in that radiation band I always think of radiation bands in micro- microns, so it's between 14 and 16 microns. So in that range, the CO2 captures everything, but there's no more radiation for it. It shares that range with water. It's got to share it, so it captures everything because it's superb at it. It excites all those molecules, but there's no more radiation. It's done. It's had its day. It shot its bolt. It's over. Let me go to the next slide now. Okay. There it is. I've colored blue where the CO2 has captured the heat. That's the best way to explain it. It's captured the heat. Now, so, and by the way, if you go further down the graph to the right, you'll find things like methane and things like this, but they haven't got the opportunity. They are excited by different wavelengths, which don't have the opportunity. Uh, they haven't got much gap between the base and the, and the outer curve. So they are quite minor, really, compared to CO2. So without CO2, the planet would be a lot cooler. We need it. And of course, it's plant food. We'd all be dead without it, of course. So so the, that's the amount. I think of that a valley there as a bucket. So the big question is, now the surprising thing here is the alarmists at this point agree with us. So the alarmists think the same as I've explained so far. Yeah? Okay. What they say, what they say that's different is if you double CO2, you're going to get a lot more warming. And they. Um, so I want to go to the next movie now, if I can. Oh, no, this is not a movie. There is H2O. There's the amount of H2O on the bottom in blue. That's how much it captures. It's by far the most, water vapors, by far the most important greenhouse gas. And the green bit there is, is what is captured by the CO2, to give you some perspective. Yeah? Okay. So as you can see, underneath that green bit, there's still quite a lot of CO2. Blue. There's still quite a lot of blue. It slopes down, but there's still quite a lot of blue. So it has to share the green, the CO2 has to share its the radiation that excites it. There's only certain frequencies that excite the CO2. That's the problem. So CO2 is everywhere, but there's only certain frequencies that cause it to vibrate and store the heat. Next slide, please. Now, this, this is the CO2 across the bottom in 20 parts per million. Today, we've got about 420 parts per million. And up the side is its effect on temperature. You don't have to bother about the numbers. The first 20 causes all that heat on that first bar on the left. Mm-hmm. The next 20 is a lot less heat. The next 20, less and less and less. So as you add CO2, you're not adding more heat. It's very little you add because it's what we call saturated. I don't like that word, uh, but um, let's call it saturated for the moment. And that is the problem. Now we're looking at this graph. At 150 parts per million, all life on Earth, except for maybe a few microbes in the sea, dies. So all the animals die, all the plants die, everything dies at 150. At the last glaciation, it came very close to that, came to 180. Uh And then if you go along there, you'll find the the next one is the pre-industrial level, which was about 280, 285, and the level in 2010... And then the next one is if you double it, which we're not at, by the way. So what what everyone calls climate sensitivity is how much extra heat will we get if we double the CO2? So to make life simple, let's call it 400 today. How much heat will we get from going from 400 to 800? So let's do that calculation. Next slide, please. And there we have it. 
Now, what I'm going to do is that's a that's a movie. If you can click on it, it'll play. There we are. That's all I was using the movies for, to do little bits. Now, in that CO2 valley, and it's like a bucket. If you pour more CO2 in, it overflows. It doesn't do anything. But you'll notice a red line to the side, a little bit. So it isn't quite the same valley. There's a little bit of extra heat <coughs> because of the red, the red line around it. That yes. is the extra heat. That's the extra heat you grab from doubling CO2. It's minus. This, and it this is out. it, right? That's it. Pardon? This is it. That's it. Only, only a little bit of off heat is uh... only a little bit. And if you measure that, if we double CO two, which no one is going to do because I don't think there's enough fossil fuels we can get burned to do it, but the whole range would only be 0. 0.7 of a degree C, 0. 0.7, 0. 0.7, yeah? okay. 0. 0.7 for. But that's not. Gonna, I mean, so in the next hundred, two hundred years, maybe a fifth of one degree C or something. Right. So what? Now this is where the alarmists differ. They agree with that, but then they say because of the extra heat caused by this, it'll warm up the atmosphere, as it would, by that little bit, but that creates more water vapour. Water vapour is a greenhouse gas, so it gets hotter, and the hotter creates more water vapour. That creates hotter, that creates hotter. So they have this feedback thing. That's not true. There's no evidence for it. But if it was true, when the El Nino came and heated up as it does the earth and it does it quite quickly and successfully we have we've been having it over the last few years it's heated the oceans at the moment if that happened then that also would do more water vapor and so on anything that warmed the earth would do it and this is where they fall down this is totally where they fall down okay so and by the way whilst we're on that graph you can see the ch4 which is methane down on the right there and it hasn't got the opportunity, even though it's a superb greenhouse gas, the frequency that excites it's way down there and it doesn't create actually much extra heat. And it has a short life as well. So, so that's that situation. Now, th so this is radiative transfer. Now, as it happened, when I was, when I was before I was going to give the talk, I met a physicist um, in the in, in the in this one of the speakers who'd done some work 13 years ago about 12 or 13 years ago doing it a different way and he came up with similar answers so for me the meeting was very exciting me, meeting this physicist and i will be doing a podcast in january with him because he came up with a totally different way of doing this <coughs> it's similar and that's always nice to have but again what i'm showing you with radiation is not disputed what's disputed is the feedback Got and it. it's false that's the, feedback, it. Uh, that's the clouds and vapor feedback okay that's right well if that was true anything that caused warming would have a runaway in effect and what would stop the heating you can, they will argue well if the ice caps you know if the heating causes the ice to melt then the um, albedo effect will but being reflected on the sun back will stop that'll cause more heating because it's no longer but what and that causes more water vapor there's actually nothing to stop it if you go into it right it just carries on forever, according to them. That's called right. runaway. They say it's not right. runaway, but it is. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work like that at all. So this is a fundamental part of what I have to get across. This is the heart of the deception. And the truth is we need more CO2. We and need more, more CO2. <laughs> much more. We, we, we want to have as much CO2 as possible. As much as possible. We can't have too much. You... You are breathing out how many parts per million CO2, do you think? I don't know. Did you I tell you? Please. Well, the, the Earth at the moment is 420. You're yes. breathing out 40,000 parts per million. 40,000? 40, 40, yeah. Okay. You okay. are breathing out in weight, in weight, yeah. um, 0.8, well, two pounds, that's the old unit, but almost a kilo, almost a kilo of CO2 every day. Every day, one every kilo human. per person. Every adult human. Well, just under. It's uh, it's about ninety percent, ninety five percent of a kilo. The average human, every Got day. It. Yes. Got it. And that's good. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a story. People used to say that the old ladies, the old grandmas, were silly who said they talk to the plants and they grow better. Yes. Yes. It's but in true. fact, it's the CO two, right? That's because they're breathing huge amounts of CO two <laughs> on the plants. Yes. Got it. Got and it, if you spend it. a long time inside your greenhouse, in a little greenhouse, you spend time doing that, you're increasing the CO2 a lot. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a CO2 meter. When I give talks, I put the meter on the table. And as the talk goes on, the CO2 in a classroom, it gets to about 2,000 parts per million. Yeah. I see. CO2 is a harmless gas. Sub Submariners breathe it in at seven and 8,000 parts per million. So mm -hmm. it's a harmless gas. Um, it is an indicator of lack of ventilation. It's a good indicator. But in itself, it's a harmless gas. Um, but I it's see. a wonderful gas because it's plant food. Okay. So, okay. Let, so let's go to the next slide. Now, this is the same thing. On the left, we've got, on the left, at the top, we've got the Sahara Desert. And this is the theory. So on the left-hand side is all the three theories. On the right is what the satellite measures. So okay. there's, your, there's your dip. You can see your CO2 dip. And all of these, first two, on the, we'll get the bottom one's different. But on the, on the Sahara one, on the Mediterranean one, there... Well, yes. you, you, you can see the dip where the CO2 is. Now look over and see what the satellite measures. This is the rule I mentioned. You've got to check it against observation. You've got to prove it that not just theory, but it works by when you look by experiment. And this mm -hmm. is proven. Yes. Now yes. here's a shocker coming. What's happened down at the bottom to the Antarctic? Well, it's got a hump. It goes worse. It goes where it actually puts more heat out than 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 an earth without without CO2. Mm -hmm. It I puts see. more I out see. because it's a hump above the line. Let's go to the right and check. Yep. When we observe by satellite, there's a hump above the line. Why? Well, actually, now this is a real corker. CO2 helps cool the Antarctic. It cools it. Greenhouse gases cool the Antarctic. This is why NASA's measured it one degree of centigrade uh, for the last four decades. Antarctic has been cooling because of CO2. But it's probably finished now. Anything we add won't do any more, probably, to that. But CO2 cools the Antarctic, not warms it, as people think. And it's actually measured by satellite. So I'm not making this up. Why? And it's because of this. Everywhere else in the world is different to the Antarctic. Everywhere else in the world, as you know, when you go up in a plane, even the Arctic, when you go up in a plane, it gets colder. Yeah? Yeah. The Antarctic is so big as a continent, so massive as a continent, that it actually gets warmer as you go up. It's called the Antarctic inversion. Okay. And it's caused by that. It's the opposite. So it puts the greenhouse gases out there to send all the heat off to space. Yes. Interesting. That's what's happened in the Antarctic. Yeah. Okay. So uh, and that, that's important. So, and the fact that all this is borne out by the right hand side. So, the theory on that, what you've just seen from that paper, is proven by direct observation of the satellite. Understood? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Next slide, please. Right, the benefits of CO2. Uh, lots of people have seen this. I've used a very common example. The same species uh, grown uh, just with different levels of CO2. On the left-hand side is today's level, 400-ish. And then as you increase the CO2 to double, that's how much the same tree grows. Yeah. In the greenhouse, they put CO2 in to grow much bigger plants and much bigger tomatoes and everything. It costs a lot of money to do that, so they don't do it for the sake of it. They do it because CO2. Let me explain something now. Plants take in CO2. And CO2 used to be between five and 7,000 parts per million in Cambrian times, 540 million years ago, when all life on Earth began in the oceans. And the animals there, at first, didn't have shells, and they got eaten a lot. So some of them decided to get shells. It became very popular in evolutionary terms. But the trouble is when they died, they buried the CO2. So when we, we start off with 5,000, 7,000, and we get down, we get down low, low levels before pre-industrial of 280. And after the glaciation, 180. So, so you know, we, we really are in drought levels of CO2, drought levels of plant food. If we had more CO2, all the plants on earth would grow better. But let's look at the evidence for this. Yeah. And I'll explain something else. In the leaves of plants, there's little tiny holes called stomata. And these okay. these breathe in the air. They take the CO2 out and they eject. CO2 is a carbon atom with two oxygen. 
and oxygen is poisonous to plants so they inject the oxygen and keep this carbon to grow with that's what they're made of you are as well we're made of carbon so so just you breathe in as well but um the plant um has to give away maybe 100 molecules of water of moisture for every molecule of co2 it gets so the big the more co2 it gets the less water it needs it doesn't lose as much water because of this more it, it can survive droughts better because of this it's encroaching on things like the sahara desert because there's less need for water right and the stomata are a very very good way of looking back historically and determining what the co2 levels were i and see the, that's the stomata. so yeah. and it's better than ice cores it's better than ice cores for that and there's a reason for that but that's a separate subject so if i'm saying these are benefits to co2 then what we should be experiencing is record crops yeah one survey uh, over 30 years uh, up to 2010 42 scientists and i think 12 institutions and so on they came to the conclusion working together that the extra vegetation on earth in 30 years in 30 years um, was worth two American land masses, USA land masses put together, like taking zero vegetation to being vegetated. And uh, they, they said two thirds of the growth of the plants they studied was because of CO2. Other studies say 30 percent. But there's no doubt somewhere between 30 and 60 percent of plant growth is because of extra CO2. And by the way, it's not us who put it all in the air. The CO2 has come because after the little ice age in 1690 it started to warm for 150 years 150 years before the industrial revolution and even when we had the industrial revolution with little old britain we were not putting any significant quantities in until the 1960s of co2 uh -huh. so the world wasn't doing a lot till the 1960s so we warmed out of this naturally as we warm because of the natural warming cycles these oceans, which store 50 times the amount of CO2 than the, than the atmosphere, started to give off CO2. So the estimate today is 80% of the extra CO2 since the Industrial Revolution is natural and 20% is man. Yeah, right. But man's doing us a great favor putting it in. So what we're going to look for now is evidence, evidence of this extra CO2 on, on, on crop. We should have good food supply, shouldn't we? Because we got this extra fertilizer. And there it is. This one is the um, cereal crop uh, throughout the world. And it's growing. Now, the, the third line down is the population growth on Earth. The actual, um, the actual amount of cereal is growing faster than the population growth. The bottom line across almost zero across the bottom is land use. So we got all this extra production with that land use, not just because of CO2, but because of CO2 and better farming, fertilizer and so on. But but CO2 is playing a major role. So we have world record crops. Where do I get this information from? Anyone go to World of Data on Google to find World of Data and look all these things up yourself. Next slide, please. So what, what what you're trying to say here is that CO2 uh, made is made possible the the increase of uh, food production, right? If correct, like, correct. The more CO2 correct. we have, because they say the, the other best. way, around. the alarmists say because the yeah, because the plants, these plants we're looking at, evolved in levels of CO2 f at least three times, maybe four times, what it is today. Uh -huh. So they evolved for higher level of CO2. They're used to it. So if you've got something that evolved for high levels of something, if you if you if you deprive people of oxygen and lower it to a, just a low part of what they're used to, they will be struggling. So plants are having a real hard time. So if you look at the dates, etc., when all this took off, you know these are the plant groups. And by the way, Romania is one of those there. This is the corn yield. And Romania yeah. is one of those there. Again, yes. experience record crops overall. Now, there's variations. You have poor seasons, bad seasons, but the overall trend is up. So there we are. There we are. We say CO2 helps, and it does. Yes, it, it's the reverse of a pollutant. It's a wonderful thing. It keeps us warm, but not too warm. And it feeds our crops. Yes. And without it, we'd all die. That is the situation. Right. Next one, please. 
Right. This is rice. Now, I was showing you cereals and then corn, but rice is a very important thing in the world. Same thing. Look at the extra rice production. Yeah. Correct. So, uh, and again, world of data. Go to it. Not my. None of the figures or information I give. I always give references. I, I have made now over 90 videos on climate, uh, all trying to educate people. And no one ever wants to debate me on evidence. I've sat outside Oxford University with a big banner saying uh, renewable energy uh, is unworkable and unaffordable. Debate me. No one will. I'm trying to get <laughs> professors to debate me. I, I, I've done everything. I have done two debates. There's quite funny stories. I've done two minor debates where they were forced to do it, in effect, with Extinction Rebellion and so on, you know. So uh, and the, uh, one in one debate, they ended up telling me that uh, gas should be used, which is quite good for that. And the next debate, they told me, which was on a Zoom call, they told me that they could use coal. Uh, and so I just ended up with laughing. I mean, totally different to what they're saying. Anyway, let's move on. So we've, we've dealt with some of the CO2 things there. Now, this is a super important graph from Tony Heller. Tony Heller is a great site for going back in history and and debunking climate alarmism. That is the CO2 graph from Hawaii, from the Mauna Loa Observatory on the top of a mountain in Hawaii. That is a graph that's not mine, uh, and everyone agrees on. This is the alarmist rise. And if you look, it's curving up. So the CO2 is growing faster and faster and faster. That is a fact. The little ziggle is caused by the seasons. So in the winter, you know, and in summer, you're going to get different CO2 levels as the whole vegetation breathes and dies and breathes and dies. But it's always rising. All the comp conferences and COP meetings are plotted on it. They don't make any difference at all to it. None at all. Are you still there? Yep. Still right. here. So, so why are they, when they do a COP meeting, they all pat each other on the back and everything. They're doing nothing. They're not changing anything. India uh, and China are burning more. Well, we're burning more fossil fuels now than we ever have done in history. So it's all a big lie. They, they fly in private jets to try to stop all this. You know, they have the conferences, what we're going to do, what we're going to do. And the result is nothing. And now someone said something. I always forget who it was, that if you keep repeating the same thing and getting and not and don't expect the same result, you're mad. Yes. And these right. our politicians right. are mad because they are doing nothing but pretending. This is the emperor. I don't know whether in your culture you have this. In our culture, we have the emperor without clothes. Yes, we have, the, have it. You have yeah, similar, have it. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and this is the emperor without the clothes. This is all these politicians pretending they're doing something. So why should we ruin all the Western economies for something that's going to make no difference to anyone at all? Because it isn't. Yeah, this yep. is a really critical graph from Tony Heller, fundamental to understanding the fraud that we're in today. Next huh. graph, please. Right, now, how do they deceive us? This actually, I think this is the USA um, NASA records, which is the same as NOAA, and this one is what was recorded in the 1930s. You can see it ring there. In a little red ring, and you see, like today, or about 2010, probably, right? It's lower than the 1930s. The hottest time in the USA was the 1930s. Yeah. Yep. Until the hockey stick came out. This is 1998 and 1999, around there. Then the hockey stick came out from an under, well, from a postgraduate, not a professor, not a person with a PhD, a person working towards that called, called Mann. And he, brought out a hockey stick, which is the biggest fabrication of rubbish you could ever imagine, right? I, I, and I've done video yeah. exposing it, but uh, there's books this thick exposing that, the fraud, fraudulent nature of that. So now let's go to the next slide. That's 1999. Press it. No, press that. It may be, that may be a video, actually. Oh, press no, this one. Okay. Go back, press it and see. Yeah, it's a video. Record. Here we have... So, Clearly, the 1930s were hotter. And then it cooled, as we know, from the 1940s until 1980 when it warmed again. But clearly, the 1930s were the hottest. But just two years later, in 2001, NASA have a new graph for the same period. And suddenly, the 1930s are now cooler than today. But hold on here. I can hear the alarmist cry. 
you just compared global temperatures here to USA temperatures. That's not fair. <laughs> but just to make the point, here are the USA temperatures adjusted, and it's just the same result. <laughs> so what they do is they lower the temperatures of the past, uh -huh. but they're not very clever. So, so as Tony Heller exposes, they he took 2011 as an example. Yeah. Now in 2011, it was so hot that 40,000 people died in Paris from a heat wave. Yeah. So yeah. I did a video. I did a video, and I the video was called. They didn't. I didn't give the date. The video was called not this one. The video was called um, 40,000 People Die in Paris. So I come on like a news desk and I say, there's 40,000 people dead in Paris. There's the stories, terrible, this and this. Oh, by the way, this was 2011. And by the way, NASA has made this and NOAA the cold, one of the coldest years. Yes. So in actual fact, you know, you can expose a fraudulent nature of this. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, but they change all the temperatures. You're not seeing observed temperatures. You are seeing adjusted temperatures. Adjusted. Now, the problem with lying, the problem with lying is as time goes on now and we're cooling, it's going to get harder and harder and harder. Yesterday, I got back in England last night and uh, in Britain last night. I have been Wales, not England. And uh, uh, one of my subscribers sent me, a, a bloke called Matt, um, sent me a really interesting thing. You can go on the NOAA website and you can give two dates and say, show me the trend in temperatures. And, and I did, and you can pick anywhere in the world or you can pick the whole globe. And, and it's instant, you get, the, you get the history. And the problem now is there's no trends. The trend, the trend in, the, it's showing the cycles now. And the trend now, the trend now is down. In other words, since 2016, global temperatures have been declining. That's not what you're being told, is it? But according to their own website, because once you lie, you've got to keep on lying. It gets harder and harder and harder. Yeah. And there's a whole industry dedicated because there's a lot of money in this. There's trillions being spent on this rubbish. So I just wanted to expose some of the deception. But let's move on a bit. Next slide, please. Now play this, please. It's a video. These heat waves throw out time. And of course, you're being these heat waves are much hotter than the past. <laughs> and of course, the reason for that is that they fiddle the temperatures. They quote temperatures like Heathrow as a record for the UK. That, that thermometer is on the runway. Look at this animation. I had one of the runways in Heathrow Airport, would you? But that's exactly what they've done. They've taken the record temperature from this station at Heathrow, with all the jets not just taking off and landing, but also taxiing and turning so the jets go right onto it. It is unbelievable. This climate station is right in the middle of the urban heat island effect. It's in the middle, basically, of a city, and the whole area is subject to a much higher temperature than the surroundings. OK, so you can see the sort of fiddle there they do. Now, I've suggested that what they ought to do is light a wood fire at home, you know, in the stove, and measure the temperature one metre away, and get that as a new English record. That could be a new record for this coming year. In fact, you could do it. You could do that on Christmas Day and say it's a record temperature for Christmas Day. That'd be a good idea because that's the world they live in. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I just yeah. wanted to expose that. Next slide, please. Now, to get around this problem of temperature gauges, and what's happened in in um, what's happened is that the urbanisation of temperature gauges with 75% um, Willie Soon and um, the uh, Connollys in, in, in Ireland, the scientists, uh, I've looked at European ones, for example, and found that 75% of the temperature gauges have become urbanised. They just stood still whilst buildings were built around them. And that totally distorts it. It's like you've got your own self-heating climate change. To get around this problem in America, they got the money because there's lots of money for alarmism. So they got the money to build a standard reference network, 100 stations, perfect, triple redundancy, the latest technology, we're going to do this right. And they put them in about 2005, and they don't refer to them anymore because they show no warming. That's it. That's called the standard reference network. Yeah. Okay. There was a man who was asked to peer review some of the work or some of the work going on at this time. He was asked to peer review it. And when he looked at the data, they divided America into six parts. And they ha you had to forecast 
which part's going to get warmer and which part's going to get cooler the next year. And they only forecast, so he looked at it, but their forecast was one out of six. They only got one right out of six. So he thought, well, hold on here. If I was rolling dice on average, I'd get three out of six, right? Right. right. So he wrote to them and said, look, on this, on my 10-year average, you only get one out of six. So they looked at it, and a month later, they came back to him and said, you're right, but it doesn't matter what average you use. If you use a 20-year average, five-year average, two-year average, it doesn't matter. Every one of them, we only get one out of six right, which is worse, which is worse than, um, sorry, you're on the wrong slide there, which is worse. Go ahead. Go ahead with the slide. Next slide. Next. No, stop there. Which is worse. You know, go back. <laughs> sorry about this. Go back a bit. Right. Hold it there. Don't play. Uh, that's a that's a video. Don't play it. Um, so which is worse than guessing. And then when they wrote back, they confirmed it worse in every case. So he said, oh, fine, you have to withdraw the paper. They said, no, well, what's going ahead and being published. He said, you can't do that. You're worse than random. You're actually making it worse. I can't believe it. And they went ahead. So he wrote a book on it. I did a video on him. He wrote a book, a whole book, because he was just amazed as a peer reviewer, how they just ignore simple things like that. Okay. Let's look at forest fires. You hear a lot about that this last few years. Play the yeah. video. It seems that just about everyone in the world would have heard of the forest fire scare stories, how they're increasing due to climate change. While well, looking at this graph and how forest fires are growing, maybe one should be concerned. Well, be concerned until you realize and you go back in time with this graph what we're suffering now from is nothing compared to the past, as you can see. But more important, when President Biden came into power, he had all this part of the graph deleted from the official records. This is intentional hiding of historic data. Looking at the global scale, the study here shows a complete decline in the forest acreage burned as we progressed through the last century and this. Both in the curve above and in the bar chart below, you can see the sharp decline. The entire forest fire alarmism is a simple lie. <laughs> well, there we are, you see. This is intentional lying. This is intentional deceit. I'm showing you the official records for forest fires globally, uh, and NASA as well, you know, everything. I'm showing you the official data. But when they don't like it sometimes, they just delete it. <laughs> yes. And yeah. uh, and of course, people, they can't get away with it because because that came that forest fire record came from the official forestry people who me measured it. And you're not going to believe this. But back in um, back in 19 back in the 1930s and 20s and so on, people were still able to measure how many acres there were. You know, acreage has always been measured because it's down to what land you own. So acreage measurement and land measurement has always been very accurate. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? Sure. This one. Oh, yeah, that one. Now, I did some work on droughts. The worst, this is just the UK. We're being told, you know, this drought, that drought, worse and worse. So I listed the very worst droughts in order, the worst one. The worst is at the top. The worst drought in British history that we know of, that we know of, was 1756 to 68. Look at the dates. 1756, 1700s, 1800s, 1800s, uh, 1800s, uh, into the 1900s. And none of those periods was CO2 a factor. Not one did we have CO2 as a factor. Yet the worst droughts were in the past. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah, interesting. I just thought I'd show you that. But actually, I went to the government report in Britain and it agreed with it. It agreed with me that there's no sign of any worst droughts, right? In actual fact, the worst was from the past. That's the difference between us. But they had to politically say it's true that there's no sign of any worse, but they didn't point out the past was much worse. Next slide, please. Right. This is Peter Ridd in the corner. He worked for Cook University in Australia, and his he was in charge of the team recording the health of the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, he reported it was at its healthiest. I'll cut a long story short. He was sacked. He was sacked. 
And about a year or two after that, a 35-year study, a 35-year study by a whole team from Australia, independent of him, nothing to do with him, came out with this chart and recorded it was a record high level. The Great Barrier Reef, despite what David Attenborough says, despite anything else, is at a record high level. It has natural cycles caused by cyclones and the bleaching can be intentional. Did you know the coral goes through different phases? And so when you say bleach coral, you don't mean it's dead. What you mean is it's got rid of its of its residents. And uh -huh. actually, sometimes we'll get rid of them and take in a new type of resident to suit it better. And the other point here with coral, they say things like, oh, as the temperature warms, the coral will die. Well, hold on here. The best coral in the world is in the coral triangle north of the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah, north. Yep. Yep. That is two to three degrees hotter, the water there, than in the Great Barrier Reef. Coral <laughs> love warmth. Coral likes it. It is total, total rubbish and nonsense, right? And I had some, I was going to, I do television every week at the moment in, in the UK. I've got 50 minutes with an alarmist on the other side. And on the train, someone saw this graph. And the person, he, there was no seat on the train. There were three men standing by my seat. And he saw it, he said, that's rubbish, that's rubbish. And a big row ensued. And I said, well, I can prove it. You know, I can give you the references. And I always do, by the way. I give all the references for these when I use them on my site. And um, and it caused a major row. But no matter what you say to some people, you can't change their mind because it's become a religion. And a lot of children are being watched. This is a religion now. Yeah. Next slide. Right. This one is the average monthly Arctic sea ice. But it's a video of this. Now, this one shows you this decline. In actual fact, they shouldn't have put the straight line there. If you look at that fairly, you'd come down and then you'd level out. You yep. Me? yep. But no, let's play their game. But when do they start it? They started in 1979 right. after the, at the peak of the Little Ice Age scare. Yes? That's yep. when it was the biggest ice. Play the video. This is a graph of Arctic sea ice extent since 1979. It's from the alarmists. And there they've drawn a nice straight line down. Although, frankly, it shouldn't really be like that because it's pretty well leveled out um, this century. In fact, just putting that graph on a different horizontal scale and stretching it out a bit, it's easier to see this pause. It's leveled out for nine of the last 10 years. So what's the historic record before 1979, Mike? And as you can see, historically, the sea ice Arctic extent was cyclical and bore no relationship to the rising CO2. And in actual fact, the highest ice level in the, in the recent times was in 1979, the start of the alarmist graph. So let's merge the two graphs together, the alarmist graph, which starts in 1979, and the historic graph. And there you have the deception. They have hidden the history, just like they did with forest fires and many other issues. They use the starting data cycles at the highest or lowest point in order to deceive you. <laughs> and you see the 1950s were much lower. The 1950s were much lower in ice extent. You see, so by, by just showing you little bits of curves, if you've got a curve and they're trying to show you heating, they'll start when it's cold. Yeah, yeah. If, 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 if it's going the other way, they'll start when it's one. They will just change the date to show you just part of a cycle, and that's deception, right? You can weather is not climate. To even understand Arctic, you'd have to look over at least eighty, hundred years to even understand the cycles. Some cycles are two hundred and odd years, so and three hundred and so on. But weather is not climate. But today we have weather. The climate, I called it, I coined the phrase, I think I was the first to coin it, called extreme weather alarmism. And I coined it many years ago because I saw it coming. Yeah, they used to say weather's not climate and agree with me. But these days, any incident, you know, if I went outside now and it started to rain, they'd say it's climate. You know, they're saying all sorts of things are climate. Anything is climate. Yes. So um, there we are. The, so we can have the next, I'm just showing deception. Next slide, please. Right. I have an MP, and this is the story of the ultimate denier. Now, many people may not, not, may not be good with science. I accept that. But most people, with the aid of a calculator, 
can divide one number by another. Yeah. <laughs> my MP can't. My my MP who's in the cabinet, who's in charge of all the MPs in, in the government, sits by the Prime Minister. He can't do this. So let's go through the story. Play the video. Every single solar and wind farm in the UK misleads on how many homes it can power by up to 500%, seeing as all you have to do is divide the power output of any wind or solar farm by the average needed for each home to get the number of homes. It's a matter of simple division, dividing one number by another. For example, Owls Hatch Solar Farm claims 49,305 megawatt hours of output a year. That was the 2022 figure. The UK average per home, according to official figures, 14.9 megawatt hours per annum. The number of homes supplied is the power output divided by the 14.9 needed for each home equals 3,309 homes. The problem is that Owls Hatch claim up to 14,000 homes are supplied, as does every other wind and solar farm in the UK. It's totally misleading. <laughs> My MP, a senior member of the UK government, refuses to accept that simple division because to do so would mean the entire basis on which they're promoting wind and solar farms in the UK would be exposed as false. <laughs> now, it's worse than that in a way because, um, because um, you know, the, the fact that he, he is next, I thought I've got a brick wall of ignorance in front of me, bricks, and this one little brick, which you can prove by dividing one number by another. And it works for every every wind and solar farm. If I could get him to accept that, then I've got straight into government, alongside the prime minister to say, hey, hey, hey we've got to be careful here. No, they can't accept it, because to accept this simple division means the, that's the beginning of the crumbling. Because my idea is to get one brick out the ignorance wall, then I can put a crowbar in and lever the wall down. <laughs> that's my plan. And he won't do it. So I'm trying to expose this on television now as well. So I mean, I'm exposing this everywhere. It drives me mad. He called me. He called me a conspiracy theorist for coming up with this. So I'm serious. In writing, I've got it in writing. Uh, and the television people wanted the proof. I gave them my email. I gave him his answer, and so on. Right. And I've tried to get him out of it. I've written to him and said, "Look, I don't want to embarrass you. Let's try and do this. I'll sit down with you." All you've got to do is divide one number by another. He won't do it. He won't answer me. He won't respond to me. He's an ignorant man leading. Now, he, it matters more to him and the government that they waste trillions and pour a lot of poor people into poverty. They do tremendous damage to our country and to the people. Locally, to me, they are closing a steel plant um, of its official turbine, of its official furnaces and putting electric in the government is giving 500 million pounds towards doing this but the new furnaces only melt scrap they can't make top quality steel you need proper steel for buildings for transport all sorts of bridges everything so we are now going out of that business so we have to import that then from china or somewhere you with me yeah. yep Yep. And someone just wrote on my side today. And by the way, I think it was Croatia. We've just closed our, our last furnace as well. We are, we are depriving the whole of Western economies, depriving them of all sorts of things, making ourselves weaker, and not just weaker, and, and uh, but also very prone to, down the road, in effect, blackmail by China. We really are. We are, we are being so stupid. And this man is just ignorant that he can't divide one number by another. And I am going to bring that man right face to face with that worldwide. I'm going to do all I can to expose the ignorance of this man calling me a conspiracy theorist for that calculation. Sorry for getting angry, but it really it's gets me only, angry. And it's a, only a matter of dividing one number by another. That's it. Yeah, you take. Let me again, the power output. So the yeah, yeah, I, so much power. And then they say so many homes. You can put that number underneath if you wish. That'll give you the power. Off gem, our standard home, our average home. It's not my figure. It's the government figure. Yes. Uh, but the government figure says 20% electric, 80% gas. Okay. Yes. They only supply the 20% electric. So what they should say 
is we will supply 10,000 homes, providing <laughs> providing 80% of their energy is coming from gas. From gas, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and that is what they're doing. They're just taking the small part of the home, not the home. But when people hear they can supply 10,000 homes, they just assume, oh, they can power 10,000 homes. No, they can't. Yes, mm -hmm. they can yes. only do that. And by the way, even the 20 percent, even that they can only do, providing they've got every megawatt they produce, every megawatt are backed up by gas, because when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, it has to come from gas anyway. So even that 20% has to come from gas. And there's no possible storage system for energy. Um, I, I was the water resource engineer for Dinoic pump storage in North Wales. It was the biggest pump storage scheme in Europe at the time in the 70s. 9.1 gigawatt hours. So I calculated in 2018, as a simple case to explain, not the worst, just a simple case. We had nine days without wind, 7,200 gigawatt hours. We got 9.1. 7,200. You can't afford batteries. If Britain tried to put a battery in for that, at today's prices, it would cost three and a half trillion pounds. But you couldn't do it for that because that demand would strip all the world of its resources in batteries and the price would go 10 times higher than that. So batteries are useless for grid storage. Absolutely useless. Yeah. And there's no other storage system that doesn't exist. I, I, I've done videos on this. I'm an engineer on that. I can tell you it doesn't exist. People say, oh, what about the sand battery? Well, besides the amount of space you take up, you can't get electricity in and out fast enough. It, there's all sorts of issues. But people are just ridiculous. There is no grid storage solution, right? None. Full stop. So that's where we are with things like this, man. Okay? So uh, what, what? that's the world I live in. That's the world I live in. Can we have the next slide? Sure. Now we can play this. Play it. It's got sound with it. I can't help feeling that today the globalists, the WEF, the UN, the IPCC are now joining the crowd, the World Health Organization, are trying to control the population and treat us like sheep. They are the shepherds. The dogs are 15 minute cities, climate scares, no internal combustion engine cars, reduced food supply, restrict travel, Russian energy, digital currency, and lockdowns. These controls and more are being used to herd populations, all based on a lie about soon. Okay. I've just doesn't finish there. <laughs> who controls the food supply controls the people who controls the energy can control whole continents and who controls money can control the world henry kissinger that was my presentation Thank you very much, but I will not let you go until no, you... No, lots of questions. I love questions. <laughs> until you will tell me the story with the 50 minutes. So in UK, you have that Oxford uh, crazy experiment. Yeah, okay. Right, let me and explain people that. Are, people are eager, people are eager to, to, to find out more about uh, this 15 minutes madness thing. Okay. Imagine, imagine you have a cake and you slice it into six pieces. So you have mm. six pieces, yes? Yep. So you slice Oxford into six. Yes. Yep. Now, if you're, you're everybody's in their wedge, they're in their one piece to go to any other piece. You cannot just go across. It may be 100 meters. No, you can't do that. Not by car. So okay. you have to go out and drive all the way around and come back in. Yes. Okay. So so a grandmother who now picks up her child, her grandchild from school sorry, from home, takes the child to school in the morning. In the afternoon, collects the child, brings the child home, sits with the child till mum comes home. Yeah? A normal family arrangement. We all have different family arrangements. Yes? Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we'll take, now we'll spend 15 minutes or so doing that. No traffic, no problem. Done. Under this new rule, 40 minutes in heavy traffic. It's impossible. But 
it gets worse. Then you're only allowed outside your house in a car to go leave your sector 100 times a year. If you go more, including work, including going to visit your mother in the hospital, anything, 100 times a year. Over that, it's a £100 fine each time. And that's law, right? Already. That's what we want to make law. It's prototype. Doing. It's just a test. That, it's a pilot. That, that's a prototype test thing going oh. on. They, these people are stupid. They, um, uh, there's no other words for them. Uh, and they won't get away with it. They will not get away with this, right? They simply will not get away with it. It is total. It's evil. It's actually evil what they're doing. Now, I'm all for clean air. I'm an environmentalist. I'm a very keen environmentalist. I'm all for lots of things. But then I don't support a, a wind industry in Germany that kills 200,000 bats a year, that destroys 3,500 tons of it flying migrating insects, affecting the population, which has a lot of ecological effects. Which I don't support a wind farm off of Holland that kills nine, over 90% of the diving bed population gone. 90% gone. Okay. I don't support these things. I don't support um, solar panels flushing off evil contaminants without any means of disposing of them down the road properly. I don't support um, the wind industry uh, at all in so many ways. Let me explain. In A group of MPs, not me, looked at three wind farms in Scotland and found that 50% of the time we were paying them not to give us the power. The contracts say we have to give take everything they give. Overnight, we have low demand, it's windy, lots of power. Oh, sorry, we can't have it. We have to keep the grid in balance. We have paid Belgium 10 times the amount, 10 times the amount to take it from us. Yes, because we have to get rid of it. But now what we do is we pay the wind farms, switch off, and we'll pay you for the power you would have done. Yeah, that's what we wow. do. That's what you, pardon? Wow. Yeah, so that's that, what that, we do. That, that, that I didn't know. That for me, it's like uh, news. Uh, okay, next uh, pay people are not to produce so the prosumers yeah because they are prosumers the prosumers yeah. now are paid not to produce correct in in the uk correct i i think you'll find elsewhere as well wow i think wow. you'll find this everywhere. because here in romania they complain the prosumer the all prosumers complain oh but you promised mr government you promised that if we install you know photovoltaics and everything uh uh then you will uh, pay us when we produce. And they didn't pass the law. The yeah. government didn't pass the law. So they don't pay people, you know, when no, they no. produce. The, the, um, the, uh, the other thing is this. With wind and solar, well, solar we know. I know it's news. I know, these, I know our governments don't understand this next bit. But where I live, at least, we have nighttime. And there's no sun. Of course. Yeah. And it more or less this time of year, quite a lot actually. No sun. We haven't got it's dark outside now. Yes. Yep. And there's no solar power, right? And also with wind, the wind stops everywhere. In fact, it can stop not just in the UK, it can stop over large parts of Europe as well. Right. Sure. When we have to back that up, the only thing we can back up with is gas. Nuclear is stable, it can't change quick. Coal is stable, it can't change quick. The only thing is gas. So the story I'm going to tell you now gets worse. Not only do we have to back up every single bit of renewable energy with gas, but it forces us to use open circuit gas instead of closed circuit gas. Now, closed right. circuit gas stations are efficient. Open circuit, uh, but they're not fast to change. Open circuit are fast to change, more suited to back up. But they burn 30 to 50% more gas <laughs> for the same energy. For the same energy. So, in other words, we have very wasteful gas stations now. So, all the extra costs of having to build all the gas to begin with and then using gas inefficiently. Yes. And then, when I told you about that before, about the solar and wind only doing 20%, that actually is being very kind to them because they get paid for what they produce, generate, not for what gets to the grid. But because sometimes they're a long way away and have little cables they have up to 17% loss before they get to the grid. So wow. the 20% becomes maybe becomes maybe about 16 or 15%. Are you with me? So, so it gets worse when you look at it. And then it gets worse in other ways. It gets worse in other ways. 
So um, our, our offshore wind industry has just demanded 70% price increase. All these are meant to be cheap. The, the biggest lie, all right, then, I've got a, a thing I call the PB index, the Paul Burgess index, and it's per capita, per capita, how much your energy costs in each country. Yes? Yes. And the, all the countries with the most wind per capita have the most expensive electricity. Full stop. Nice. Look at Denmark, look at Germany, look at UK, or all up there. Yeah. Uh, uh, the uh, more uh, wind uh, you uh, use, the more expensive it is. Correct. The more wind and renewables you have, the more expensive your electricity. It has to be. It has to be. Well, look, if I said to you in your home, uh, I'm going to put a central heating system in, and I'm going to ask you to use it on uh, electric. But I can't supply the electric all the time. So what I'm going to do is have you install another one in gas. So you're going to have two systems. Well, immediately, immediately, you, you, you've almost, well, you've doubled the cost, if not more, almost immediately. Yes. So mm. that's what you've got to do nationwide. For every mega, there's no way out of this. You'll hear, how about storage? How about hydrogen and things? Hydrogen, to make a kilowatt of hydrogen, you need two or three kilowatts of electricity. And then they'll say, I'll tell you what, this is the latest fraud by our government. Let's let's actually burn more fossil fuel, but we'll bury CO2 in the sea, underneath the sea. We'll bury it. The cost of this is enormous, by the way. Yeah, it's silly. Another one is capturing it from the air. That's been tried and failed. You can do it technically, but the cost is more. You produce more CO2 doing it than you do, you say. Yeah. Uh, and so, so all these things don't work. And what you can't do is base a plan for a whole country and a whole economy on things that aren't working and tested. My People say on television, they call me a climate scientist. I don't know what a climate scientist is because I don't regard any of them as scientists because unless they follow the rules of science, they're not scientists. And I thought about it when they called me that the first time. Should I call myself just a climate realist? And then I thought, no, I've monitored climate for a whole country. I collected all the data, supervised all that. So I collect climate day. I build climate models to forecast droughts, thousand year droughts, all that sort of thing. Um, so I do all the things. I do much more than that. So I've done all the things. So if you're a geologist looking into uh, ancient things, you know, sediments to make, write a paper on climate, you're a climate scientist. So I'm just a different one. I'm a water resource climate scientist who's done all these things. And I'm also a hydrologist, of course. So, so I am a climate scientist in their terms. The only difference is I'm real. I'm willing to prove, you know what, it wouldn't bother me if I was wrong. Because if I, on a debate, I'm wrong, I'll just say, yeah, I've got it now, I'm wrong. Because I'd rather be wrong than carry on in bliss, blissful ignorance. And you can't carry on in ignorance. And so I, 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 I'm totally open to that. What actually happens to me, what actually happens is people attack you personally. They don't attack, attack what you're saying. Yeah, argument about hominem. That's right. They attack you personally, not what you're saying. And, and what you, what I and I have no respect. Somebody, I showed you the runway at Heathrow with a gauge. Yep. And someone just had a go at me. And Mickey O'Toole's had a go at me. An Irish chap, I think. Mickey O'Toole's had a go at me on my channel. And he said, you said it's on the runway. So I said, yeah. And he said, it isn't. You're a liar. And I no. said, well, it, what I meant was, and he said, no, the planes would hit it if it was on the runway. You're a liar. He ignores all the video and all the evidence and concentrates on this point. Then he gets a friend to come on and say, I agree. You said it twice on the runway, on the runway. Yeah. I said, well, in fairness, I showed a map. Where it was. You know, I didn't say it was in front of the plane. It's on the runway complex. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And, yeah. and they go on like this, but they don't. They don't. You know, and by the way, and by the way, the heat doesn't stay on the runway only. The heat dissipates. Yeah. So it's. Yeah. I know. <laughs> It's a and, matter and another of people, oh, someone that someone nice called me someone this morning called me a glorified plumber. Yeah, I've done a <laughs> master's apparently and everything and built mother mother models as a glorified plumber. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, their debate, that's their debate strategy, right? At home, yes, that's debate. right. So th that's what they do all the time. I find it amusing. I don't censor people who just do that to me. Sounds, I have sounds censored like, someone sounds like, uh, sounds like pandemic uh, paradigm. You know, yes. they create yeah. the problem, they agitate the problem, and they come with a solution that's worse than the problem, but produce population control. This is the yes. only way. This is the way I see it. It's what I what I did for that what I did for that cheap video was actually had the real dogs 
on the thing and I just put the things over them. So that's why the sheep moved with it. And the, and the shepherds were WHO, IPCC and so on. They're the group, they're the shepherds organizing the dogs. Yeah. yeah and these yeah. are the dogs. So the 15 minute city is a terrible, terrible thing. They won't get away with it. They will not so get away. In UK, it will not be. So the pilot test will fail in Oxford, right? No, well, it will. They're still trying to push it. It will fail. When is the People, when is the period uh, when the pilot? I don't, I don't know because they're they're secretive. I mean, they've got so many restrictions now. In Wales, we've had all our 30 mile an hour speed limits reduced to 20 overnight. Yeah, and it doesn't make any sense. We have motorways where they just reduce the speed limit to 50 for entire sections. So if I go to London on the motorway, I'll come across traffic jams on the motorway because they reduce the speed limit. Why? To save CO2. <laughs> so, not yeah. for safety. No argument for safety. For safety to reduce CO2. No. I, I mean, the whole thing is bonkers, from top to bottom. You know, But what's happened to me is I'm getting a bigger and bigger profile now. And at the um, at, at the conference we had in Romania, I had this um, a scientist who a physicist who wrote a paper in 2011, and he was worried about what I was going to say. And I I saw his lecture, which I thought was very good on deaths, uh, COVID deaths. And uh, when I when he came out, I asked her to see him, and, and and he said, "What are you doing, climate?" And he was worried because he thought he was going to sit there and listen to rubbish. And as it happened, he got very excited when I told him what I was going to do, because it's all about radiation from the sun. I mean, that's what I explained. Uh, yeah. and I don't understand the things. And I don't say CO2 is not a greenhouse gas. I don't say CO2 is very little. For only 400 parts per million, you can't do anything. That's nonsense. Of course it can. Yeah. So I, I'm a realist. I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a truth teller. I'm not a, not a nutter. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Paul. No, there are not uh, any more questions. The people are really uh, worried about this thing with 15 minute city. They look yeah. they, all of the eyes, all, all of the world's eyes are are uh, on the uh, Oxford thing. And yeah, 100 want... cities, 100 cities around the world have signed up to it. By the way, could you yeah, not, could you could you publish my YouTube channel thing? Could you give people the link sure, to my YouTube? Sure, 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 sure. Please, because, please, please. Um, because can you that's WhatsApp that, me uh, real quick? Can you WhatsApp it real quick? Or? So can I? Yeah, well, I, I'll just uh, what a WhatsApp. Yeah, okay. And um, I will do a uh, lower third here. I will. I will display. Okay. It. Uh, well, I'll just read it out to you. It's very simple. Okay. Cool. It's YouTube.com. YouTube.com. Okay. Forward slash. Yep. Ampersand, like like you're doing a, an email. The ampersand, yeah. Yep. Little squiggle, yeah. Yep. yep. Uh, um, climate realism with the spaces. Climate realism by Paul Burgess. Climate realism by Paul Burgess. Let me see if I did it correctly. It's correct. No, you need the spaces. You need the spaces. No, no, you haven't done the right uh, squiggle. No, that's wrong. After the dot com, after the slash, it's the yeah. squiggle. The ampersand. Like oh, an email. Excuse me. Like yeah, an email. Type, just typo. That's right. But you now must put spaces. Climate, misspelt. <laughs> okay, no we problem. We must put spaces between the words. Okay, you climate. Must put climate. Climate really by, by Paul Burgess. All with the spaces between. Spaces between. Yeah. Climate, space, realism, space, by all the spaces. Just like you're writing it. Yeah, yeah. Like this? That's it. That is how you can watch my videos. You can ask me questions. There are all sorts of topics. All sorts of topics. Um, the um, So, you know, that that's really... I don't make any money out of it, by the way. I'm down many thousands of pounds now, right? Nothing. I do, you know, all my time is free. And most of the time I don't... Even when people pay my expenses, they don't pay all of them. You know, so I, I'm really... Um, I'm not doing this for money at all. Right. Do you have any books written or something? Do you write books? Do you publish? I books? don't write books. No, um, because of my history, I do everything on video. Even yeah. I'm doing a new thing now, which is really detailed. I'm doing uh, to prove the little ice age and, and medieval warm period. Because if you prove they're real, because they did away with them in the climate, climate alarmism world, there's no little ice age, no medieval warm period. 
and um, I will prove it was hotter then. And I'm doing it's a big it's a big video. This so I do a lot of research, but everything mm. is proven. Everything is step by step. And at the end of it, so I go to the Himalayas, look at sediments. I go to South America. I go to China. I go, but I go sea levels. I look at sea levels going back. Now, as it happens uh, in Wales, we have castles all built by one king all around the edge. Yeah, and they're all built up the sea, and actually. Yep. They're all eight foot too high because the seas dropped eight foot because he built those in the medieval warm period. But the castles built in the cold time, they're at sea level. Yeah. <laughs> but the castles built. And so you have gates to chuck people into the, you know, if you misbehave, you got chucked out the gate, out the door into the sea. Well, now you'd land on grass. Yeah. So <laughs> things like that. But, but I, I'm doing it so everyone can understand it, even children. But I also give all the scientific support it's global and worldwide there are actually over 700 scientists over 400 papers in 42 countries have done papers in support of the medieval warm period so but that by itself by the way is not science me just claiming that is what we call an appeal to authority i don't do that so what what, what when i mention a paper there is the evidence that's different yes yeah. there is, there is the evidence and we check it against reality Always, always. You can have, if I went two or three years ago for an appeal to authority to cosmologists, they'd all tell me that galaxies couldn't be formed as early as the James Webb telescope was discovered. Yeah, James right. Webb is discovered. Uh, and the whole of cosmology now is in a mess, which is great for them because it's really good, interesting science again. Right? Yep. Okay, well, well that's it. Thank you very much for a uh, very interesting speech. And I think now... Uh, I've done justice to you because those 20 minutes were like nothing. Your presentation now uh, was uh, uh, a whole. It was completely, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, you you had enough time to show to the people all of these slides and all of your uh, uh, thought process. Yeah, I did this time. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.